Hello, Ramgineers, and welcome to this webcast on contracts, terms, and conditions. This is our preparatory lecture for next week's class, where we're going to discuss, you're going to analyze contracts, and we're going to discuss terms and conditions. So these are our learning objectives for today. The first one is for you to identify clauses in professional service contracts and, and determine whether they benefit the client or the designer. And there's a whole list of the ones there. I'm going to prioritize those for you in just a few minutes so you know which ones are most important. <clears throat> the second learning objective is for you to analyze contracts for these terms and conditions um, and determine whether they're appropriate or not. And for that one, we're actually going to have you, you're going to do that in your exercise um, before class. So these are our learning objectives for today. So I want to first give you the three most important things to know about contracts and, and analyzing terms and conditions. This is very similar to the three most important things in real estate. The three most important things are to read the contract, read the contract, and read the contract. I cannot overemphasize this. I think the worst contractual problems I've ever had are, are problems that came up because a contract was signed and one of the parties in that contract didn't really read what was there. It was really obvious that something was bad or wrong and it just wasn't read. That's a surefire way to lose your job, by the way, is to sign a contract that you didn't read and then have it go south. So some quick guidelines to reading contracts. The first is to look for red flag language, especially superlatives. Superlatives are things like best, highest, any and all, make sure or ensure. These are things that if you say them, it, it like slams the, the meter to one side. This is like pegging the meter. There is nothing better than best. If you say you're going to give the best service to your client, that means there's nobody else in the entire world that's going to do a better job than you. You might be good, but you're probably not that good. So whenever you see these words, you should have little red flags popping up and going, okay, what does this mean? Because you could get yourself in trouble. And let me give you a really quick example. So here's a clause that you might see in a contract, say, that where you were doing construction management services for a client. The company will inspect all work to make sure it complies. Well, you know what? This is... Uh, this is uh, set you up for failure here. Do you think if you're, do, you're doing construction inspection that you're going to see all the work on the site and you're going to see everything? Do you think it's possible that the contractor might install an a underground water line and, and cover it up before you had a chance to look at it? This is going to set you up for trouble because it says right now that, that, um, that if, if there's something on the site that you just didn't happen to inspect, it didn't have time to inspect or didn't occur while you were there, that you're still responsible for it because you inspect all the work. How many inspectors will it take for you to ensure that you inspect all the work on the site? A better um, clause would be that the company shall report observed failures of the contractor to the client. So this says you're only obligated to report those failures that you observe, those things that are wrong that you observe. And you can have a discussion with your your client about how much they want you to observe and how much it will cost to do that, but you're still uh, only uh, obligated to this to observe, uh, to report those failures that you observe. This is a much more reasonable clause. So be really, really careful of um, superlatives in contracts. Another thing that you need to know when reading contracts is that headings and section titles mean nothing. You can have a section that's titled standard of care and it can have payment clauses in it. The pay payment clauses are still uh, are hold force of law, even if they're under a heading that says that, uh, standard of care. So don't, when you're looking for something in a contract, don't just go to that heading and read that section. You have to read the whole contract. You just can't trust headings and section titles. Okay, so let's prioritize this list of uh, terms and conditions because there are a whole bunch we gave you. I'm going to give you the big five that are ones you need to be most concerned about. The first is the standard of care. The second is indemnifications. The third is damages, then guarantees and warranties, and final, finally limits of liability. The other ones we're going to cover today are change orders, dispute resolution clauses, termination clauses, 
time is of the essence, ownership, and choice of law. These are all, all really important, but the big five are the big five. Okay, standard of care. This is the single most important contract term and condition as far as I'm concerned. It's just absolutely critical that the standard of care is correct in your contract. By now, you should all be able to state from memory the standard of care for a professional engineer. If you can't, this is it. That degree of care that engineers of ordinary knowledge and skill would use under the same or similar circumstances. This is statutory. It's required by law. It, it, it doesn't have to be written down. It doesn't have to be told to you. Whenever you are practicing as an engineer, you are held to this standard. Now, the problem with this standard is it says that you're going to, it implies that you're just going to provide ordinary service to the client. It says you're only going to be held to that degree of uh, care that ordinary engineers would do. Well, who wants to be ordinary? The thing that you need to understand about the standard of care is this is the legal standard to which you're going to be obligated. It's not the level that which you're going to perform to, either desire to perform to or will perform to. It's the legal standard. It's stating what is the legal requirement. You do not want to be responsible for a legal requirement that's higher than that's, than that's necessary. So again, the standard of care only specifies the standard that you're legally obligated to. It does not limit the quality of your work or the level of your performance. Just because you're performing, you're, just because you're legally obligated to the ordinary professional standard of care doesn't mean you can't do excellent work for your client or charge him for excellent work. It's just saying when it comes to the law, you're not going to be held to a standard higher than any other engineer. That's the key part. Now, it's important to understand that if the contract is silent about the standard of care, then the statutory professional standard of care applies. So it, it doesn't have to be written into the contract. In fact, the lawyers that worked with me when I was practicing preferred that we not have anything in the contract about the standard of care because then we knew exactly what the standard of care was. It was that degree of care that engineers of ordinary knowledge and skill would use under the same or similar circumstances. However, my experience is that most clients don't want a contract that does the, where the standard of care isn't there. They like to see the standard of care in the contract. So you need to be very careful about how you write the standard of care in the contract. Because if by statute you're held to the ordinary standard of care, then the only thing you can do, in, then, you, then you cannot lower the, the standard of care in the contract. If you write in the, con in the contract that, that you're uh, obligated to uh, that degree of care which um, crappy engineers would use under the same or similar circumstances, you can write it in the contract, but it doesn't change your obligation to meet the statutory standard of care. So you cannot lower the standard of care in a contract. So anything you put in the contract, uh, the best it can do is for it to not change the standard of care, but you can raise the standard of care. And if you raise the standard of care, there's a bunch of problems with that. First, you're saying, I am legally going to be obligated to a standard of performance higher than every other engineer. And so if you are, you'd better be charging for the extra work to meet that standard. And the second problem is the ordinary standard of care is defined by laws, defined by case law. And it may not be perfectly understood, but it's understood better than any other standard of care because there's years and years and decades and decades of case law that define what it means to be an ordinary, to practice as an as a engineer with ordinary skill and knowledge. If you write some other standard of care in your contract, it's not clear what it really means legally. So the key is you should never be held legally to a standard higher than necessary. And so you should never be held to a standard of care higher than the ordinary standard of care. And if you write it in your contracts, you should be sure that the language is such that it, is, it meets the ordinary standard of care and it's not some heightened standard of care. We do not want heightened standard of care in our contracts. And again, that doesn't say anything about the level of your performance. It just says, what are you legally obligated to? All right, second big one, indemnifications. These 
uh, are sometimes confusing to people. Conceptually, they're really pretty simple. You guys have actually probably signed indemnifications a whole bunch of times in your life already. What an indemnification is, is an obligation to pay for a loss caused by somebody else. So what it does is it really transfers liability from one party who would ordinarily have that liability to another party. Now, the place that you've probably seen these the most is when you go to visit a plant or a site, or if you like to go um, um, zip lining, then you sign, every time you do one of these things, you sign something that's the, the, to the owner that says that you will not hold the owner liable for any loss or injury uh, for your zip lining uh, across the park. Well, the owner who's running that thing has an, has an obligation already to protect your, to, he has a standard of care and he has an obligation to protect you. And if he doesn't meet that obligation, then, then he's obliged to pay for any damages, whether that's your medical costs or loss of life or anything. And when you sign that identification, you are transferring that liability from him to you. So if you die, he didn't have to pay a thing. So you've signed, you, you guys have probably, every one of you signed an indemnification, whether you realized it or not. Now, indemnifications aren't necessarily bad. They may be perfectly appropriate. However, they are often abused. And here's the key concept. We talked about risk management um, in the la uh, two blocks ago now, I think. And the key to risk management is if you can manage your risks, then you can improve performance or you can, you can, you know, you can beat the, uh, the competition if, you're, if you can manage risks. But that, in order to manage risks, you have to align the risk with the potential cost. In other words, the person who has the ability to manage the risk needs to own the risk. So if often a good indemnification was it does, it aligns the risk with the person who's able to manage that risk. And let me give you an example to explain that. It's very, very common in construction to have indemnifications for construction site safety. So here's a good example at, at Angelo State right now. The um, museum is being constructed. And if you go over to that construction site, there's a fence all around it. Uh, the, the padlock that's on the gate to that fence uh, is owned by the contractor. The contractor has a key to it. Nobody on a, an Angelo State University has a key to that, uh, to that gate. And the contractor controls who comes in, who goes out. The contractor controls all the safety rules that are uh, enforced on the site. The contractor's ability to throw somebody off the site. So the contractor has the ability to control the risk and hazards on that site. And anybody visiting that site, the, the risks that they're under are really under the control of the contractor. Well, that site is on ASU property. So by statute, normally ASU would be responsible for what happens to anybody on that site because it's ASU property. So if somebody got injured, it would be ASU would be responsible for that. Well, that doesn't make any sense because it's the, as soon as the contractor puts his fence up and puts a key on it, it's the contractor who has control over the site and he has control over the safety rules on this site. And so if we want to align the risk of somebody getting injured on that site with the person who really has control over it, we want the contractor to be responsible for that. So it's very common and very appropriate for the contractor to indemnify Angelo State for the risk of injury on that site. And so what he's saying then is, well, I realize Angelo State, you normally have be responsible for uh, somebody who was injured by a third party on this site, but I'm going to take that responsibility on because I have control over the site. So that's an example of a perfectly appropriate and, and very common indemnification. The trouble is, whoops, let me go back to that. The trouble with indemnifications are that oftentimes they're, they're just a transfer of liability to another party who doesn't have control over the risk. And so the, the key, that, go back to that key concept. If you're looking at an, at an indemnification, ask yourself, okay, the first question is, who's transferring the liability to whom? Who owns the liability without that indemnification and who's taking on the liability? And then ask yourself that, about that person who's taking on the liability. Do they have control over the risks? And if they do have control over the risks, then that's probably a good indemnification. But oftentimes it's just a... It's just a way for somebody to get rid of all their liability and put it on somebody else who doesn't have control over it anyway, and that, that's not really appropriate. Okay, let's talk about damages. It's really important that you understand the difference between actual damages and consequential damages. 
So actual damages, or also called direct damages, are damages that are caused directly by some action. Something bad happened, and something was directly, there was some um, injury directly because of that, and, and that's a direct damage. And the thing, uh, the characteristic about direct damages is they are predictable, and because they're predictable, they're manageable. And I'll give you an example in just a second. And consequential damages are also called indirect damages. They don't come directly from the action, but they flow because of that action. So it's something that happened because, uh, not directly because of the, of the, 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 act, the, the original action, but it happened afterwards. They're sort of like dominoes that fall. And the characteristics of them is you really can't predict all the dominoes that are going to fall when something bad goes on, and so they're really not manageable. So let me give you a really good example of this uh, from, um, from my experience as a, as a geotechnical engineer. So my company was out working on a, a, a site investigation in front of uh, one of the big Disney hotels in Disneyland, and we got our drill rig out there, and we got it all set up, and we're drilling holes, uh, holes to induce site investigations, and they drill right through the main electrical feeder for the hotel. Bang. All the electricity in the entire whole hotel is down, all 20 stories of it. Okay. Uh, we clearly had a, a – we, we very clearly had an obligation to uh, to uh, do site investigation beforehand to identify where the utilities are and avoid a uh, – there were, clearly was a uh, – we had a duty – we clearly breached that duty, uh, and there were clearly damages. So what is the direct damages for that? The, the direct damages are the cost to fix the electrical line to put it back in service. We cut the electrical line. We fix the electrical line. Whatever that cost is, is the direct damages. What are the indirect damages? Well, the indirect damages are everything else that happens after that. Maybe the hotel feels like they have to move everybody out and put them someplace else. And they, they lose revenue from that. Uh, maybe because the lights were out, uh, somebody on the 19th floor had a panic attack and uh, went running down the stairwells and tripped and broke their leg. Uh, there could be a million scenarios that you can think of that aren't directly, aren't, they, you know, we, we, the, the person falling down the stairs on the, um, um, running, running down the stairs because the, the power went out and the emergency lights came on wasn't directly caused by us cutting the line, but it flowed from that. That's an indirect or consequential damage. So um, the, the key to understand this is the direct damage, we can manage that. We know what is, we, we can estimate pretty clearly what it's going to cost to repair an electrical line if we hit it or a water line if we hit it. We know the things, we know the actions we can take to mitigate that. We know we could do additional investigation beforehand to identify where the utility lines are. We know as engineers, if we just take the plans for that and, and look at the as builds and somebody said, drew a line on a piece of paper and said, yeah, this is where the line is, we know it's, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty with that. And we should go about beforehand and do uh, work to identify where the utilities are so we don't hit them. So we have control over that risk. We know the cost, we know the mitigations, we know what the mitigations cost, and we can make a rational decision about how much work we're going to do beforehand to avoid hitting utility lines. What we don't know is everything that could happen after we hit the utility line. Um, so, and we can't manage that risk. So the direct damages come directly from them, and the key concept is they're predictable and manageable. The indirect damages, because you don't know what they are, you have no idea how many dominoes are going to fall you can't manage them because you don't even know what the costs are or how they might happen. So the key concept here in your contracts is, one, you should be limited, uh, that your damages should be limited only things caused by negligence. You, so negligence, remember, is the definition of what it means to be legally wrong. When you're negligent, you're legally wrong. And if you're wrong, you should, you should own up to your mistakes. If you did something that wasn't, exactly it was supposed to be done, but if you're not legally wrong, you shouldn't have responsibility for those. So first of all, we want damages limited to negligence. So lots of these contracts, one of those superlatives you'll see, you'll see in these contracts that you're responsible for any and all damages, whether caused by negligence or not. There's two problems with that. The first is any and all, and the second was that you're responsible for them even if you're not negligent. So they're saying, well, even if you weren't wrong, you're going to have to pay. And, and that's not right. So first concept, limited to negligence. Second concept is that 
you should definitely be responsible for your direct damages caused by your negligence, and the other party should be responsible for direct damages caused by their negligence. What you should not be responsible for are the indirect damages, and it's only because they're unpredictable, and so you can't manage them. So every, every party should be responsible for direct damages caused by their negligence, and the indirect damages, um, they should just be taken on by the party who suffers the damage because they can't be, they can't be predicted. We don't know what they're going to be. They can't be managed by, by anybody, so that's just the luck of the draw. Indirect damages are indirect damages. Those are the, the key concepts. Direct damages only, and only neg da damages caused by negligence. All right, guarantee and warranties. These are two words that are often used interchangeably, and they shouldn't be because they don't mean the same thing. A guarantee is not a warranty. A guarantee is an obligation to pay a debt or satisfy an obligation of another. Um, what that means, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an obligation to, to, to do something that you wouldn't otherwise be obligated to do. So some really common ones which you hear all the time is a money-back guarantee. So when you go to the store and you, uh, and you pick up an item and you buy it and you go to the front and you pay somebody, you just had offer, acceptance, and consideration. They offered this thing for sale. You took it to the, to the register. You gave them money. Um, you accepted their offer and paid them money, and the, the consideration was you got the good and they got the money. Contract done, contract completed. There's nothing in the law that says that they have to take that item back. Lots of stores do because they see it in their business interest to do it, but that's a guarantee. It's not something that they're, they're obligated to without that guarantee. Another great example that you see all the time is low price guarantee. Yeah, we'll, we'll match anybody's price. There's nothing in the law that says that my contract to you for what I'm going to charge you for something has to be the same as somebody else's price. But So if I say I'm going to do that, that's an additional obligation that I didn't otherwise have. So those are examples of guarantees. Uh, a warranty has two different definitions which we need to distinguish, or two parts of the definition. One is a promise that a fact is true. Um, and so you'll see lots of times in contracts to, to warrant things that are facts. So you might have to warrant, for instance, in a contract that all the drawings will be stamped by a registered professional engineer. Well, that's a fact. You have to do that anyway. And there's nothing wrong with you warranting that that's a fact. You know, if you have to, uh, there's no problem with you warranting facts. The other warranty is an assurance of the character or quality of a good or service. This is a warranty that you hear lots of time again with, uh, with goods. And this is the warranty you said, hey, I, this has got a one-year limited warranty, or it's got a lifetime warranty for a product you buy. And what the manufacturer or the seller then is saying is, well, once you buy this thing, I don't really have any other obligation, but I'm going to uh, go beyond that and say, if uh, something doesn't perform the way you want it to in a year or two years or five years, I am going to fix it uh, for nothing or for a small cost. Uh, so it's again, it's it's um, an, it's a promise to the, about the quality or goods of a service. All right, how does it apply to us? Well, for professional service contracts, warranties of facts may be okay. As I said, if it's a fact, it's a fact. If they want to warrant that the sky is blue, fine. Tell them, yes, the sky is blue. Um, so that there's nothing wrong with warranting facts that are, that are obviously facts and they're true facts. You don't want to warrant something that might not be true, but if it's clearly true, that's fine. The thing you shouldn't do is warrant anything that's not clearly a fact or true or provide a guarantee that's... Uh, for, for something, because there were they're inappropriate professional service contracts. They're perfectly appropriate for goods or goods contracts, but it's inappropriate in a professional service contract for us for for us to warrant the quality of our design for the for the life of a building. That building is going to be around for 50, 80, 100 years. Who knows what's going to happen to it? Who knows what's what it's going to be like? Who knows how it's going to get used or whether it's going to get maintained? There's no reason for us to warrant or guarantee our work like that. And an, another issue with, with uh, warranties or guarantees is just that engineers, design engineers, have such a small part of the value of a contract. You may have a $5 million construction job, and you're going to get paid a couple hundred thousand dollars to design it. There's no way you're going to warrant or guarantee everything that went on in that contract. You're not, you're, you're not responsible for most of the quality of it. It's, it's the... Um, the contractor who built it is responsible for most of the quality of it. 
So bottom line is warranties and guarantees outside of warranting facts are inappropriate for professional services contracts. Okay, let's talk about limits of liabilities. Limits of liabilities are really nice if you can get them. One of the characteristics, which I just discussed about a lot of design contracts for engineers is we have a really small part of the entire value of a project. Again, you have a $5 million project. If, if there's a lot of design work in a contract, it might be worth 10% of the value of a contract. Often it's 5% of the value of the total cost of, of a, pro, a project or even less. And so you have a project, again, you have a $5 million project and maybe you're getting like $200,000 for the design of it. That's a lot of liability out there that, that, that you're going to be associated with and you have so little payback. So it's nice if you can get um, limits that just limit your liability. So in the worst case, you don't lose like any more than, than you build the client for. So in the worst case, all your work is free. That's still going to cost you a ton, but it prevents you from being on the, on the hook for like millions and millions of dollars worth of liability. So they significantly reduce the, party to the, the risk to the party receiving them. In this case, we like them from the engineer's standpoint of view. I can tell you they're really hard to get. Most clients don't like that, um, and they're really hard to get. But if you can work a limit of liability in your contract, you should. Uh, I almost always tried to have them in there, and I would say 7 to 10 out of times they got uh, cut out of the contract when we were negotiating. Uh, but it's a really good um, risk management tool if you get it. It's almost like insurance if you want to think about it. Okay, change order provisions. So things aren't always go the way you expect them. And the question about change order provisions are what happens when things aren't the way you expect it. Um, things always change. Almost every contract requires some change in the scope, schedule, or the cost. The question about that, what the change order provisions do is they tell you how are you going to make those changes to the contract. So what are the processes that, that are needed to agree to a contractual change? Here are some questions that you should uh, think about as you're analyzing these. Are the, are the changes, are, are verbal changes allowed to the contract or only written changes? Who approves the changes? What is that process? Is the process realistic and timely? I see many, many, many times in contracts where the change order process is written such that it is going to take days, if not weeks, to execute a change order, which means you can't do any of the additional work or respond to that change for weeks. This is, really, this is a real common problem I see in contracts. And usually, the client's written in the contract because they think they're trying to control costs or mitigate their risk, and what they're really doing is setting themselves up for a big problem. And I'll give you an example about why you would want a very timely um, change order provision. So I had a contract uh, in Los Angeles once for uh, when I was at Los Angeles Air Force Base, and we were uh, replacing the main circuit breaker for an entire segment of the base, which means all the power for this base was going to be off for hours. That's how long it, these are big circuits. It's not like popping a circuit breaker out on a uh, 110 volt line and putting it back in. I mean, it takes hours and hours to replace these things. So we had a contract to do this. We'd arranged on a Sunday to take the power down Sunday. Like at, uh, He had to do this in light, so like 6 o'clock in the morning, we're going to take the power down. We had all the backup generators rented. We had everything we needed to do for the critical facilities, so the power down. So we take the power down at uh, 6 o'clock on Sunday. The contractor opens up the electrical box, and lo and behold, the hardware behind it was not what it said on the outside of the box, and his replacement circuit breaker wasn't going to fit. Now we've taken the entire base down, uh, planned this thing for months. We rented a whole bunch of, of generators, and he can't do the work. Um, and he says, look, it, I can go get the right circuit breaker. I can get it from the supplier downtown, but it's going to cost an extra $5,000. Well, what are we going to do? Well, fortunately, in this contract, I had a, we, had a, we had provisions for verbal authorization for changes. And the contracting officer working for me called me up and said, hey, look, here's the situation. He opened up the box. It wasn't what he expected. It wasn't what we told him was going to be there. Uh, you know, it's going to cost an extra $5,000. And by the way, we got to give him an extra uh, two hours to do the job because he's got to go get it. Uh, do you want to do this? And I said, absolutely, I want to do this. It's way less expensive than the alternative. And so since we had, a, uh, we had a, a change order process that allowed verbal changes, 
My contracting officer told the contractor, you're given a verbal authorization to go buy that additional piece and go get it and put it in here uh, and, and press on and, and we'll give you extra time to do this. Everything worked out fine. It all got done. Life was good. And afterwards, we wrote it up in a, a written document. He got paid. I paid the money. Everybody was happy. If we'd had a process that said, no, you can't do anything without a written authorization, there's no way we would have gotten a written, written authorization done in less than five hours. And it's on a Sunday afternoon. A whole bunch of people would have had to sign it. Maybe it wouldn't even happen that day. And so uh, lots of times clients think they're protecting themselves by requiring all changes to be written, when in fact, the nature of the job that they're doing, they really want some other sort of change order uh, process. So um, the mo this is the most common problem I see with this, is that the provisions that are put in here don't really meet the client's needs. They're really not realistic. So my recommendation on this one is talk to the client and, and look at what's there and say, is this really what you want to do? And most important for you when you're executing the contract is follow the rules. If they say it requires a written authorization, don't do that additional work until you have written authorization from them. They may be begging you, say, look, look, I don't want to get behind. You've got to do this work today. If it's not done by now, you know, uh, we'll be so far behind on Monday. And you say, I, I don't mind doing it, but you have to sign the authorization. And if they don't sign the authorization, don't do the work. All right, dispute resolution. We'll do this quickly because we've already talked about this already. Remember, there's um, uh, three ways you can resolve disputes through mediation, arbitration, or through court. Um, they all have their pros and cons. Uh, my first comment is mediation is always a good thing to try first. Um, now, the nice thing about mediation is it doesn't necessarily have to follow all the rules of law. It's, it's just the two parties getting together with a mediator to try and, and fit, come up with some solution. You can come up with very creative solutions in mediation. I've even been in multi-million dollar mediations where really only all that was needed for one person to say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. It was wrong. I apologize. So mediation is always a good first start. I highly recommend that that's in all your contracts to start with mediation. Remember, arbitration is really, uh, oh, I want to talk about arbitration versus court. Arbitration is really just private court. What you're doing in arbitration is paying an arbitrator to uh, essentially be the judge in, in, the, in the dispute. Arbitrations generally follow all the rules of law, so it's really just private court. Um, some advantages of arbitration is you can get an arbiter, uh, arbitrator who is really specialized and knows that area. There's arbit arbitrators who deal in uh, construction law. They know all about construction, and they, and they know what's realistic in construction and what's not. There's arbitrators who deal with... Um, 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 healthcare injuries, and they're really familiar with, with, with the medical profession and what's realistic there or not. Uh, so that's one of the advantages of arbitrators is you can get somebody who's actually specialized and knows the area where their dispute is. They can be expensive. In fact, they generally are expensive. They may be faster than court. I, uh, I know in, here in West Texas, I'm told by all my lawyer friends that getting court dates is really not that hard. Uh, there's really no problem getting court dates. I can tell you in Southern California, getting court, you might have a court date that's months and months and months away. And so the time that you would lose by waiting for court, uh, it may be an advantage for you to go to arbitration. Another big advantage of arbitrations is the decisions can be private. Uh, they are, they, you can have an arbitration and not disclose the terms of, uh, of the agreement. And so everybody's protected from what you know, might be dirty, dirty laundry. Now, you actually see this all the time in the news. You hear about people that had, you know, they, they arbitrated a solution and nobody knows what the solution really is. Uh, so let's talk about court. Uh, a court, either the judge or particularly the jury, w may, may lack technical expertise. I can tell you the jury will lack technical expertise. The jury doesn't understand F equals MA. They don't understand anything about engineering. In fact, they kind of distrust engineers for the most part. And so if you're in a jury trial, the jury is not really going to understand engineering or, or, or know what you're talking about most of the time. And in some cases, the judge won't either. It depends. You may have a judge who is, who is fairly knowledgeable in these things. You may not. Courts are public. So if you don't want your dirty laundry aired, you may not want to go to court. Uh, courts are generally cheaper than arbitration because most of the court costs are covered by public already. Um, the court's cheap, your lawyer may not be cheap, and the other, the other party's lawyer may not be cheap, but the court itself is cheap. Um, but they're, in some places, they're slow, as I said. Depends where you're at. And here in West Texas, courts aren't slow, and so there may not be any reason not to go to court. 
In, in Southern California, it may take you so long to go to court, and the, the loss of time may be such that it's worth paying the extra money to the arbor, arbitrator to get the arbitration done. So it depends which one's better. You need to, you need to know your situation. Uh, you just, it needs to be clear in the contract uh, how you decide which one's going first and what's required. So make sure that you, you know those rules in the contract. Uh, termination provisions. So uh, lots of contracts ends before, they're, b before they run their full term for one reason or another, and you need to know um, how they're going to be terminated if they're going to be terminated. And the questions you want to ask are, well, who can terminate the contract? Can either party terminate the contract? Under what circumstances can they can terminate the contract? Does there have to be a breach, or can they do it uh, just because they want to? So what are the circumstances, and then how is that done? How do they notify you that the contract's been terminated? And then the most important thing is what happens to, to costs during termination. Just because a contract is terminated doesn't mean that the costs to, the, to either side stop or, the, or one side may have costs that they've already incurred that aren't paid. So, for example, if you're a design engineer and a contract gets terminated, you may have work that you've already done, that you've already designed, but hasn't been paid for yet. Or you may have rented equipment that you were planning to use for the life of the contract, and now the contract's cut short, and you still have a contract with somebody else for this equipment. And even if you don't have any outstanding costs, you can't just turn off a contract. I mean, when, when the contract stops, there's a lot of work that you still need to do. You probably have to write reports to document the state of it, it was in, so that if you get sued later, which you're likely to do, you have all the notes about what really happened. You've got a, all kinds of files that you've got to put together and put them away. There might still be billing that you have to do, and you've got the people, people to do that. So a big important thing to think about during, uh, during terminations is what are, what are the costs that you're, what's your risk that you're going to have costs that aren't paid for, and how are those handled in the contract? And my advice just is use common sense. Read the termination provisions. Think about what would happen to you if the contract was terminated earlier than you expected and what might be your costs and how are you going to manage the risk of having costs there. Time of the essence is an important clause that many people don't understand what it means. Some people make, make it things that just says, oh, please do stuff on time. That's not what it means at all. If this clause is not there, without this clause, then the, the rules about time, if there's a due date in the contract, the, the rules about whether or not you've met that date are that the performance must, must occur within a reasonable time of the due date given the circumstances. So in most cases, for instance, if your contract says, hey, this, uh, this report was due by close of business on Friday, and you deliver it to the owner the first thing Monday morning before uh, work starts, you haven't, you didn't meet the time, but that's probably reasonable. I mean, what was the client going to do with it over the weekend? Nothing, right? So, uh, or if there was a power outage and uh, and the, you lost power at your uh, office for a day, you know, it's reasonable that you might be a day or maybe even a little more than a day behind. In other words, this is, you know, the normal due date. I mean, normally there's some flexibility in the due date. If you say time of the essence, what you're doing is setting a super strict time requirement. And what you're saying is that your performance uh, with, with uh, of doing something on time, if it's not done on time, is going to directly affect the other party's ability to do what they're obligated to do. So if... If you're doing something on Friday at 5 o'clock means by next Monday at 8 o'clock the other party can't do what they're supposed to do. Maybe they were supposed to do something over the weekend. And if they didn't get it done, then you know your design was important for them because uh, on the weekend they were going to do the repair. On Monday the, the plant was going to be up and running and, you know, and it's cost millions of dollars an hour to get the plants down. Then maybe time is of the essence. Um, and if time is of the essence, then your failure to perform on time is a breach of the contracts. So if you miss a deadline, you violated the contract. That's a whole lot different than if you miss a deadline and, and it was reasonable that you might be list. So the bottom line is you really want to try and avoid time of the essence clauses. If it's really true and it's really needed, then it's really true and it's really needed, and then your price better reflect the fact that you have to meet these deadlines come hell or high water. 
So your price that you give that you're asking the owner to pay for you better include the the the, the enough money that if you can put a, a bunch of extra people on this on this project on Friday morning to make sure it's done exactly at five o'clock on Friday in order to meet that deadline. So you should be very careful about time of the essence clauses. If it's not really required, it shouldn't be there. If it is required, make sure you've priced it in your price or else you're setting yourself up for a big problem. Ownership of the work. So after you deliver your work to the, to the client, who owns it? Who actually owns that product? This is, a, this is way different than if I buy a coffee mug. I mean, it's pretty clear. If I buy a coffee mug, once I bought it, I own it. But this is your own intellectual work. And who owns it? Um, if it belongs to the client, then they have complete control over it and they can reuse it. So if you designed a Taco Bell for San Angelo, Texas, and, and somebody goes up to Bozeman, Montana, and builds the same hot Taco Bell, if, you, if they own the design, theoretically, they can go to Bozeman, Montana, and design, uh, build the same Taco Bell. And it probably won't work right. The temperatures are different. The HVAC system probably isn't going to work. Certainly, the foundation conditions are going to be different. The foundation may be totally wrong. So in general, we don't want clients to own our work. Most engineers want to own their own work afterwards uh, for that reason, also because they may want to reuse some of that work in another project. In a, another project, They may have come up with an innovative design, and they want to be able to use it elsewhere. So we generally don't uh, want the client to own the work. We want to own the work. We give the client uh, complete... Um, um, authorization to use it for this project, whatever is needed for this project, but it, usually we want to own it. Uh, I'll tell you, if, uh, um, for public clients, lots of times public clients, uh, public contracts will have clauses that say uh, they own it afterwards. I think this is a reflection of the, what they see in the public's interest because they paid all the money for this and they think the public should own it afterwards. It's, my experience is uh, for public clients, it's usually not a big issue because they aren't going to reuse the design. They aren't going to come sue you if you uh, reuse part of that a new, some innovative thing in that design elsewhere. So generally, my experience with public clients, it's not an issue. But with private clients, I try to always make sure that I own the work afterwards. Choice of law. This is a phrase that, that meant nothing to me until I started working on contracts. I thought it was a choice of law. I don't know which law would I choose. It, it may seem like a small, small thing, but it's a really big thing. And it really has to do with... What jurisdiction is is, are the, is the contract going to be interpreted under? And we every state has a different contract, has a different um, laws. So there's over there, there's 50 laws plus the, the District of Columbia, and then you got uh, territories and all kinds of stuff. There's a bunch of different laws in the in in the United States, and there's some cities that have laws and stuff. The bottom line is you need to know under which jurisdiction your contract is going to be interpreted. And it may seem simple, but laws aren't the same in every state. And the real issue isn't that the law is going to be a whole lot different in that state, although it might be. The biggest issue is, is you're going to have to hire a lawyer who has experience in that state uh, in order to uh, understand the implications of the contract in, in, that, in, in that jurisdiction. So if uh, Mr. Stepanovic is your lawyer and uh, you're here in San Angelo, Texas, but the state of uh, choice of law is Oklahoma. He's a great lawyer, and he probably knows all the principles of the law, but he doesn't know all the rules in Oklahoma, and you're going to end up hiring another lawyer in Oklahoma to help you with that contract. So it's really an issue of cost. So try to keep the, uh, the laws within your state. This can be difficult with national clients. The company I used to work for was... Um, um, headquartered out of Atlanta, Georgia. And so all of our contracts said um, uh, uh, Georgia law applies in this. Well, that didn't go over real big with some of our clients who didn't have lawyers in Georgia. So lots of times we had to change that. Um, so it can be difficult with national clients who expect the, it to be under the law of where they're, wherever their, their headquarters law offices is. Because they're trying to do the same thing you're trying to do. They're trying to make sure they don't have to hire a lawyer that knows a different law in a different state or something like that. Okay, let's summarize real quick and get out of here. Um, so the first rule is read the flipping contract, read the flipping contract, read the flipping contract. There are no excuses. If you didn't read the contract and something's bad, you have no defense. Look for red flag issues, especially superlatives. You want to stay away from those. 
The big five issues that you want to be concerned about are the standard of care, indemnifications and damages, guarantees and warranties, and limits of liability. All those other clauses are important. They're really critical in the, in the big picture, but those are the five that I really want you to concentrate in in this class. All right, what are you doing next? You're going to analyze the LA Air Force Base, City of Bellevue, and Rancho Palos Verdes contracts. You're going to get together in your groups and review those contracts and, and review the terms and conditions of those O's. We'll have you submit your homework uh, before the next collaboration session. And then uh, both uh, Mr. Stepanovic and I will be on the next collaboration session, and we'll go over um, uh, our understanding of terms and conditions, and we won't necessarily agree on them because uh, he's a lawyer and I'm an engineer. I think it should be a really interesting discussion. So I hope uh, this helps you to get prepared for class, and I will see you at the next collaboration se session. And have a great Ramgineer day.